me drop you off on the summit of Mount Everest, if you could be dropped up there by a helicopter, something like that, you'd be dead in a matter of minutes. So you have to move up this mountain really slowly just so your head doesn't pop off when you get to the very top. I mean, it doesn't really just like pop off. <laughs> but the catch is that anytime you're above 18,000 feet, which is going to be any camp above that base camp, anytime you're above 18,000 feet, your body is starting to deteriorate and your muscles are getting weaker. So it's this crazy catch-22 of wanting to spend time up high to get used to the altitude. But you have to keep coming back down low so you can eat, sleep, hydrate, and regain some strength. So not only is it very physically challenging to be going up and back down and up higher and back down again, but psychologically, it is incredibly frustrating as well. But what you have to remember is that even though you are going completely backwards, you're still making progress, right? Because you're helping your body acclimatize. And for whatever reason, we tend to think that progress has to happen in one particular direction. But that's not the case. Sometimes you are going to have to go backwards for a bit in order to eventually get to where you want to be. So don't look at that backtracking as losing ground in any way. Look at it as an opportunity to regroup, regain some strength, so you're better out of the gates the next time around. Backing up is not the same as backing down. And that is one of my best lines. So if you're going to write down anything, <laughs> I would go with that one. The first part of the route once you leave base camp is this area called the Kumbu Icefall. This is where most of the accidents occur on Mount Everest. And what makes the icefall so dangerous is that it's made up of 2,000 feet of these big, huge moving ice chunks. And the sun comes up, everything starts to melt. These ice chunks, they start to shift around, so you're in constant danger of being crushed. Then it's made more complicated by these big open crevasses where you could fall hundreds of feet to your death. So you span these rickety aluminum ladders across them so you can get from one side to the other without falling in. So between the big, huge moving ice chunks and the ladders and the open crevasses, it is a very scary part of the mountain. But it's also where I learned one of the best lessons about leadership, which is this. Fear is OK. Like, fear is OK, you guys. It's just a normal human emotion. Complacency is what will kill you. You have to be able to act and react quickly when you're in environments that are constantly shifting and changing. This is Occupy Everest. Come on. <laughs> This is camp one on the other side of the ice fall. Here's the team at camp two, bringing sexy back. <laughs> we were so short that we could not even fit into size extra small down suits, so we had to have these custom made. But we liked them because we thought they were kind of flattering. <laughs> All right, here's our team getting ready to head up to camp three. It's almost 24,000 feet. This is me pulling into Camp 3, a particularly memorable moment for me because I puked all over myself right before they took that shot. <laughs> but it's a reminder that when you're in a leadership position, even when you feel like absolute hell, you still have to put a smile on your face and get out there and do what you're supposed to do because you have people relying on you. All right, Mount Everest, really, really bad place for control freaks. There are all these things that are going to affect your climb that you have zero control over. So sometimes you look up at the summit of Mount Everest and it looks like this and it looks like, you know, it might be pretty approachable. But within a matter of minutes, everything can change and it will look like that. And that is pretty darn intimidating. But the one thing you know about these storms is that they're always temporary. So the key to surviving this is that you have to be able to take action based on the situation at the time and not based on some plan. Because when you're in environments that are constantly shifting and changing, whatever plan you came up with last year, last month, last week, even that morning, your plan's outdated as soon as it's finished. Here is our team heading up to the high camp. This is me at the high camp. You are more than welcome to borrow this picture and tell people it's you. <laughs> Nobody will ever know. 
The high camps at 26,000 feet, also known as the death zone. They call it the death zone for a pretty good reason, and that's because at 26,000 feet, human life can no longer be sustained and your body is slowly starting to die. At this elevation, you have to take five to 10 breaths for every step, just to catch your breath again. Five to 10 breaths, so it looks like this. You would take a step and then you do this. before you're able to do this. Step again, five to 10 breaths again, before you're ready to do this. Okay, so if you ever think you're having a slow day, <laughs> it could be so much worse. So we get up to the high camp in the afternoon. We lay down for a couple of hours. At 10.30 at night, we get out of our tent to head to the summit. So it's 10.30, pitch dark, freezing cold. You wear a headlamp on your forehead so you can see down the trail. And I'm thinking, okay, we are at 26,000 feet. We need to be at 29,035 feet to be at the summit. That's more than 3,000 vertical feet alone we need to cover. And I start doing the math, right? One step, five to 10 breaths, 3,000 vertical feet. And I start to get completely freaked out and intimidated, thinking, there is just no way. So the only way I could really wrap my brain around what we had to do is by breaking the whole thing down into much smaller parts. So I stopped stressing out about the summit. I took that headlamp, I shined it on a rock that I could see down the trail. And I thought, you know what? I am just going to that rock. That is my goal for right now. I just need to get to that rock, right? So step, five to 10 breaths, right? Step again, five to 10 breaths. Before I knew it, made it to the rock. Once I got to the rock, did the same thing. Took my headlamp, shined it on, another rock down the trail. All right, just going to that rock, right? I can do that, that is doable, right? Step, five to 10 breaths, and then I'd make it to the next rock. So every time I would think, oh man, I don't know. I just don't think I can do this. I would think to myself, well, I made it to that last rock, so maybe I can make it to one more, right? Maybe I can make it to just one more after that. So when you feel like you have a goal that is going to be a ridiculous, hairy stretch, find your rock, right? Find your rock, because that's how you're going to make it happen. We climbed through the whole entire night that way, right? Just like from rock to rock to rock, right? 10 steps every breath. By 6.30 in the morning, we're at a place called the South Summit, which is just below the true summit of Mount Everest. And at that point, storm clouds started to come in. And the first American women's Everest expedition turned around just a couple hundred feet from the summit of Mount Everest. Trust me when I tell you that turning around and walking away from the deal is harder than continuing on. But when you're up there in these mountains, you have to be able to make very tough decisions when the conditions around you are far from perfect. And you have to think about how every single move you make is going to affect everybody else around you and not just you. So it doesn't matter how much blood, sweat, and tears you personally put into something. If the conditions aren't right, you turn around, you cut your losses, and you walk away. Oh my God, look at all the sad faces. Just so you know, that distance, it's just a couple hundred feet, but that would take us several hours, right? No, people are shaking their heads. You're like looking at me and looking at this like, why didn't you just run and touch the tippy top and run back down? But you can't run up there. You're taking 10 breaths for every step. So that's where turn around. Good thing we did, right? Because we had to use good judgment. Mount Everest, just a pile of rock and ice, right? You can always go back. If you do something dumb, you may not have the opportunity to go back. And yes, it's crushing to spend two months on that mountain because that's how long an Everest expedition takes, two months and miss it by that much. But you only have enough gear and oxygen to go for it one time, right? So once you've burned through that, you're done. But I think as long as you come back alive, <laughs> like I consider that a pretty good trip. So then you come back and you get to be the butt of Jay Leno's opening monologue joke. <laughs> and you get to go to the Today Show and you walk in and Ann Curry is like, welcome back, aww. <laughs> I was like, well, I mean, it was a pretty amazing trip. I know, but to get that close and not make it, how does that make you feel? <laughs> like a loser, Ann Curry. 
And then I'd go to a dinner party or something, and the host of the dinner party would be introducing me to the other guests. And he would say, oh, this is my friend Allison. She just climbed Mount Everest. And then the guy sitting across the table from me would say, oh, no way, all the way to the top? Right, so then you have to say, well, no, no, we actually turned around um, just a couple hundred feet from the top in a storm. Oh, so you didn't climb Mount Everest. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, I told him the whole story about how we spent two months on the mountain and just had bad luck with the weather, and I gave him the whole lecture about getting to the top is optional, getting down is mandatory. <laughs> and he said, yeah, but if you weren't at the very top, then you didn't climb it, it doesn't count. So I was like, okay, what do you do, tough guy? <laughs> and he said he worked for J.P. Morgan. So I said, no way, you are the CEO of J.P. Morgan? <laughs> you know right where this is going, right? So he, um, so he said, no, I'm not the CEO. I work in fixed income trading. And I said, oh, well then, I guess you don't really work for J.P. Morgan then, do you? Because if you're not at the very top, then it doesn't count. <laughs> and he's like, oh, that's totally different. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Thanks. Thanks. And then, of course, all your friends are grilling you, like, when are you going to go back? When are you going to try it again? This is Meg, one of my best friends, who I met actually through the 85 Bronx Network, which was sort of the precursor to the Elevate Network. And she's like, when are you going to go back? Come on, you got to try again. I was like, I'm going to go back either never or when you agree to go with me, whichever comes first. But unfortunately, Meg ended up passing away very unexpectedly, a um, long story from the flu, at age 37. So I decided to go back to Mount Everest and I engraved her name in my ice axe to make sure that she was coming with me this time around. So I left just a couple months after losing her. Whoops. And this is me on my way up to the summit in the spring of 2010, eight years after my initial attempt. And then I get up to the high camp and go figure. In comes a storm again and I thought, I cannot believe I am back here in the same exact situation, ready to go for the summit and in comes a storm. But of course, as we all know, you cannot control the environment. All you can do is control the way you react to it. So I got out of my tent and I thought, oh, man, I am back here after eight years. I'm at least going to get out of this tent and try. Got out of my tent, things started to really deteriorate. After a while, climbed through the whole night, but the clouds just closed in. Visibility was absolutely horrible. It is a 10,000-foot drop to my right and an 8,000-foot drop to my left. And I really couldn't see too far in front of me at all, but sometimes I think you don't need absolute clarity in order to just put one foot in front of the other. So that's what I did for about another nine hours. I'm happy to report that on May 24th of 2010, I actually did make it to the summit of Mount Everest in honor of my girlfriend, Meg. Oh, thanks, you guys. Thanks. 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 So take that, J.P. Morgan guy. And for me, that summit was the completion of what's known as the Adventure Grand Slam, which is climbing the seven summits, the highest peak on each continent, and skiing to both the North and the South Pole. I think there's a couple dozen people in the world now who've completed the Grand Slam. So that photo was on the front page of the New York Times sports section. So people would see the, the photo and ask me, what was that like? What was it like to go back to that mountain eight years later after everything you had been through fight your way through the storm, and finally stand on top of the highest mountain in the world. And I can honestly tell you, just wasn't that big of a deal. <laughs> you guys think about it for a second, you guys. You're only up there for a few minutes. I was up there for a half hour. That was considered a long time to be on the summit. I promise you, plenty of better, stronger, more skilled, much more deserving climbers than Allison Levine didn't make it that day for whatever reason. Most of them turned around because of the weather. People that stand up there for a couple of minutes are no better than the people who turn around just short of the top because it's not about spending a couple of minutes up there. It's about the lessons you learn along the way when you're fighting like hell to get up there and what you're going to do with that information to be better going forward. The only reason I made it up in 2010 when most people turned back 
is because I had that failure under my belt from 2002. And because of that previous failure, I knew a heck of a lot more about my pain threshold, about my risk tolerance. I knew what it felt like to get the living snot kicked out of me high up on that summit ridge in a storm. And I wasn't afraid of that the second time around. And I think in general, we're not really a very failure tolerant society which is really too bad because a lack of failure tolerance really stifles progress and innovation and prevents people from taking risks. Anyone that knows a little something about the history of Mount Everest knows the name Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, right? First guys to ever summit this mountain. Don't forget, there were dozens of climbers who tried and failed before those two made it to the summit, but those two, they had the benefit of the 411, right? All the information from those previous climbers. And maybe if those other guys hadn't been gutsy, you know, and tried and failed first, Stratman, Hillary, and Tenzing Norgay would never have made it to the summit. You just don't know. I mean, my point is, when you're going to try really hard things, when you're going to try to bust through barriers, when you're going to push yourselves far outside of your comfort zones, you're going to have to give yourselves and your teams the freedom to fail. Just come back from it better the next time around. And you never know who you're going to be helping in the future, right? Because just because you didn't get the outcome that you wanted doesn't mean that that failed experience isn't going to lead to somebody else's success down the road, right? Just like it did for Stradman, Hillary, and Tenzing Norgay. And the most important thing I need to tell you about that photo is that it's actually very misleading. Because while you do see me on the summit of Mount Everest, let me tell you what you don't see. The financial sponsors that funded my trip, the logistics providers that got our permits in order, the amazing team of Sherpas that helped us ferry loads up and down the mountain. You don't see my friends that helped me train before I left for Nepal. A lot of people had a hand in that. And what you have to remember is that nobody gets to the top of a mountain by themselves. Nobody does. All right, this is the last slide for you guys. If there is one thing I really want you to take away from this presentation, it's that you don't have to be the best, fastest, strongest, most skilled climber to get to the top of a mountain. You just have to be absolutely relentless about putting one foot in front of the other. Thank you so much for having me here today, you guys, and um, thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, and um, oh, I appreciate that. Enjoy. I'd like to thank the Academy, and no, um, thanks, you guys. Enjoy the rest of the conference.